We've got Phil talking about continuous delivery. Please take it away, Phil. Thank you, Chris. I have to do the obligatory. Can everybody hear me at the back? Excellent. Cool. Because of the setup of the room, I'm going to stand over here, leave my water over there, so that when I forget my notes, I can walk over here, pretending I need a drink, when you all actually know I'm not sure what to say. OK? Um, I did a version of this talk, first version of this talk, uh, last month in uh, DEFCON South Africa. Uh, and the keynote speaker there, the local keynote, was making an impassioned plea for people to uh, build more stuff. Um, and I, I sort of took that and said, build more stuff, yes, but I kind of want to build better stuff uh, and to build stuff better. Uh, and I believe continuous delivery is the best way to do that. Uh, and more than that, actually, I think continuous delivery is the best way to make building better stuff better, better, if you see what I mean. As in, <laughs> I think it's a more sustainable way to do software delivery. So I'm very lucky that I work with some uh, excellent teams, and they're generally quite happy teams. They're not never stressed, but they're not stressed about some of the problems that we're going to talk about today. Unfortunately, um, I was delayed coming back from South Africa by 28 hours because I'd talked a lot about making better software. Uh, and because Karma is a bitch, uh, I'm pretty sure that these guys uh, are not doing any of the things that I talk about uh, in this talk. So we will jump on from that. Uh, but who even am I? Uh, I am Phil, and I have a confession to make, which is that I am a consultant. I know, I know. Um, it's a terrible thing. They rightly have the bad reputation a lot of the time. Uh, I'm very proud of what I do. I'm very lucky. I get to see lots of different organizations. I meet lots of people that want to make things better, and so I'm very lucky to do that. Uh, I'm going to tell a couple of stories uh, that I've seen in my time, uh, the, the horrors that I've seen. I will uh, change the names to protect the guilty. Um, one of the things I think that consultancy has in common with conference talks some of the time uh, is this. <laughs> So consultants can be really good at coming in and painting a picture of what you should be doing, what it should look like. Um, and uh, sometimes conference talks are guilty of the same. They say, look, look at everything we achieved. But they're not necessarily good at taking you on the journey. And that's really where this idea of six small steps came from. Because I have very little imagination, I've obviously taken that and said, this is how you draw an owl in six small steps, because six small steps is the right uh, amount of steps. And because we like to be empirical, I've obviously tested this. Uh, and in this next step, um, because I need to be a good parent, I'm going to need uh, some applause from you for these pictures uh, in testing. It will also make the person in the next room really wonder what's going on. Uh, they'll be checking their time and be like, oh, I'm quick. Um, so first of all, we've got the effort from Parade Age 10. Nice. I don't, think, I don't think he was that into it. He rushed it a bit, but good use of blending pens, I thought. Uh, secondly, we've also got Rebecca, age 12. Very precise. She, she, used the, she used the ruler for this. Uh, and finally, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go on, Bob. So we are getting on to the six steps uh, in a moment. But first, we need to have a little conversation. And I was desperate with this talk not to make it a no true Scotsman talk. Right? I don't want to be saying, if you're not doing X, then it doesn't classify as Y, because I don't think it's useful. But we do have a problem in the industry that words that are meant to convey meaning get hijacked and get taken. So uh, I need to ask, who has used, said, written this term ever or recently? I have. Marcel has, because he used it at least twice in his talk yesterday. Um, I, right, actually, I've got another question for you. The D in this. Put your hands up if you think that's deployment. Put your hands up if you think that's delivery. OK, it's not useful, is it? Nobody knows, <laughs> right? And I, I've got exhibit A here, actually. This is a statement um, that I found online. Um, and it reads to me like a LLM gone mad, right? I mean, this last bit, what, what does this mean? Software release pipeline, including a DevOps pipeline. It, it doesn't make any sense. This was on the website of Atlassian, who make tools for continuous delivery, <laughs> and from what I understand, have a great engineering team themselves. Nobody in that engineering team is going to say this, but in the marketing uh, world, it just gets taken. So we've got to do something about this. Uh, it doesn't work. So we're going to go back to uh, the, the canonical reference, which obviously is the, uh, the Farley Humble book. Um, and I'm going to quickly give a couple of definitions. So we start with continuous integration. So that's clearly the CI bit. Continuous in integration is really simple, and it only means three things. Yep. It means that people are checking into mainline or trunk regularly, let's say at least daily. There are no long-lived branches here. If you're doing long-lived branches, great, enjoy it. Don't say it's continuous integration. Um, the second is that every commit to mainline or trunk causes a build to run, which will do some automated checks. 
And the third thing is if any of those checks fail and the build fails, it's the highest priority of the team. That's it. That is the definition of continuous integration. And it is a practice. It would be very difficult to do continuous delivery without doing continuous integration. Deployment pipeline is a pattern. All it says is that there are many steps in deployment, and we are going to try and automate those steps as much as we can, and ideally create a push button. It's a pattern. Um, that's it. Obviously, uh, features heavily in continuous delivery. Continuous delivery, like all good things, is really a mindset. And this is the definition of continuous delivery that I really like. It is to deliver at a pace that satisfies customer needs. And we do that with a simple recipe. Integrating activities into the dev process, fully automating deployments, you do need that, but then to reduce the stress of releases. And that's what I was talking about, about, the, um, uh, about a more sustainable way. So I want to do another raising hands. How many people have been involved in a big bang release, which was the culmination of, of months or years worth of work? OK, most people. Anyone that hasn't got your hand up, speak to the people that have got their hands up later, <laughs> and thank God. OK, so we're going to start with portable checks. Uh, first of all, I need to tell a little story. As I say, names have been changed. Uh, this was when we were working at a, uh, a, a well-known brand in the UK. Um, and we'd gone in uh, at the beginning of a project. They'd had lots of problems, and we just wanted to get started. And what we'll often do then is build the software. So I'd managed to get things out of source control. They were using source control. It was great. Um, and started to build things and couldn't. Things just didn't work. So I went around and asked some of the, um, uh, some of the, the, the people there, and they were like, oh, you need to speak to James. And so next week, they go, you need to speak to James. So I'm wandering around trying to find James. Eventually, I find him, kind of sidle up. I was quite nervous. I felt like I was doing some sort of dodgy drug deal. But I went up to James and said, I'm having trouble. Can you help me with something to build this software? And he said, yes, I can. And I shit you not, without a sense of shame at all, he reached into his top drawer and handed me a USB stick and said, here's the dependencies that you need to build the software. That's not what I mean by portable. <laughs> So I have more shows of hands here. Okay, who either doesn't work in software development right now or has started their professional software development career in the 2020s, in the last few years? Okay, what about in the 2010s? Okay, who started in the, the noughties? That includes me. Uh, who started before that in the last millennium? <laughs> I thank you for your service, people. <laughs> This is from the Chrysler project, uh, about 96, 97, I think. And this is kind of one of the recognized early, pre the term Agile being coined, but sort of Agile workspaces. You can see the boards at the back. You can see some people pairing. Um, this is from uh, the uh, XP book uh, and XP Explained. Uh, and I want to read a little bit of, of this. It's just, I won't read it all, but it says, after a while, we look at the to-do card, and the only item on it is restructuring the other test cases. Things have gone smoothly, so we go ahead and restructure them, making sure they run when we finish. Says, now the to-do list is empty, we notice that the integration machine is free. A key thing is here, they don't say we went to the CI status uh, machine and saw that there were no bills queued up. They said, we noticed that the integration machine is free. And it's because it's over there. That's the build machine. So at this point, people were generally going up and queuing up at, a build, at an integration machine, taking their turn in order to put the software on it, to build it along with everyone else's, and to check that it works. And so on that previous quote, you can see that there's a real desire to um, to do enough work and have enough confidence before going to that because there's a real interruption in flow. So when I talk about portable checks, I'm really talking about ways to uh, in increase your flow state uh, as, a, as a developer or as a development team. So I always talk about can you work on the train? And by that, I don't mean can you work with crap Wi-Fi and rubbish coffee. Um, I mean can you work isolating yourself from other contributors? So can you make sure that you can maintain flow state without interrupting other people? And, and really, that means doing things pre-integration. So it's really about managing, uh, managing your dependencies. So if you require, in order to test your software locally, you require somebody else's dev version, or you require hitting an environment which is, has mutatable state and it can change, all of these things just cause integration failures. The other, obviously, example is that you check code in and it breaks, because someone, or someone else checks things in and it breaks, and you're waiting. All of these things interrupt your ability to deliver quickly and to maintain a great cadence. So what we want to do is shift quality left. Simple way to say this is write more tests, right? But the reason it says portable checks rather than portable tests is your traditional kind of unit tests or integration tests are not the only things that you can do. Using lint is a great, you know, you can have uh, test harnesses, you can have simulators. There's lots of different ways you can implement, and it will depend on your individual context. But the point is you're trying to build enough checks that you can have high confidence that when you go to integrate, you aren't going to break your own flow state or break anyone else's. And the other thing we've got to do with that is obviously keep it fast running. Yep. Because the, the worse that gets, 
um, the worse that you'll find that you have interruptions. And whenever we talk about fast running tests, I think of Corey Haynes, four second test runners back in 2014. And this is the quote that I love. It says, when people ask me how fast their test suite should be, my general answer is faster. A lot of people think of the economic argument for that. How long will it take? How many times will it be run? But actually, it's the context switching argument. The longer that is, the more chance that you will get interrupted. And again, you will lose your flow state. OK, fake brick. This is a little bit embarrassing, this one. So um, obviously, like any good conference uh, speaker, conference writer in 2023, uh, I got ChatGPT to try and write my conference talk for me. Um, when I sort of said, let's make sure I'm covering everything I need to on a baked brick, because that's what we do, right? We don't ask it to write it. We just check our workings. Uh, this is what it said. That a baked brick is not a common term or concept. So this appears to be some personal Mandela effect. I've been using this term for 10 years, but no one else apparently uses it. So I see whenever I say it, we just quickly move on to actually talk about it. And everyone just goes, huh, what's that baked brick thing? No idea. So what I mean by baked brick is I mean a golden artifact. Yep. So when you are releasing software, you should be producing a golden artifact after check-in from your build, which can then be checked and goes through that deployment pipeline. There are arguments to say in some modern workflows, you don't actually need a golden artifact. Um, but what you definitely need is a repeatable build. So if you have a golden artifact, you should definitely have a repeatable build to create that golden artifact. If you don't have a golden artifact, uh, then, then that's fine. But actually, golden artifacts are really good at basically acting as a cache for a repeatable build. So we'll focus on what we mean by repeatable build. So first of all, you use version control. Everyone here is using version control, right? Right? Um, yeah. So yeah, we were. <laughs> I actually am going to have a drink now. Um, so when I'm not going to look, I'm not going to look. Um, so obviously, use version control. Everything that is required to build your golden artifact should be in version control, except what shouldn't be in version control. Gerald? Secrets, thank you. Um, so everything except for secrets should be in version control. That includes all configuration. Um, but then when it's built, it's an artifact that can be run on multiple environments without being changed at all. So uh, hence the golden. Um, contains dependencies. Obviously, most of the software that we build these days uses many, many libraries, many, many frameworks. Um, I don't know how many people here are developers, but uh, this is a problem. So uh, people that don't know, this is a wildcard uh, dependency, which means that every time the build runs, it will just pull in the latest versions of the library here. And that obviously means that you don't have a repeatable build. Your golden artifact builds at one time, uh, and it creates one thing. And the next time, with no changes to your source, it breaks. So you've got to make sure that you're managing all of those dependencies. And the final thing is to have a clean build environment. So wherever your build runs, if you're using modern uh, kind of uh, ephemeral kind of uh, SaaS products for building your software, great, you don't have to worry about it. But if you have build machines or even containers, uh, you know, you really want to be tearing those up and down uh, to ensure that you have a clean build environment. Otherwise, you can end up with local caching. Uh, you can end up with people going in to fix a build at some point and breaking things. But the, all of this is to make sure that you've got this repeatable build. OK, I'm going to go to the third place, which is environment control. Um, actually, there's, a, there's another story here. Um, so this was a situation where we found a production defect that was causing real problems. We thought we'd managed to reproduce it, um, but we, we just couldn't. Or No, we thought we'd managed to find the problem, but we couldn't reproduce the same thing that was happening in, in production. And normally, when you get to that, you're like, OK, let's go and decompile some shit, right? So we'd got the ops guy. This was a while ago. Ops guy went and grabbed all of the things down from production so that we could have a look at it and find out what was going on. And this was a J2E project. There were lots of jars. And when we went to get these down, instead of it being like system 2.1.1.jar, it was like system k 2.1.1.jar. And this was true for all of the jars there. So it was exactly the same version we were expecting, but there was a weird k in there. So again, went to the development team and sort of said, what's, what's happening here? And they said, oh, they're the k series jars. And I, as you are, looked blank. I think I probably looked, making it pretty clear that I was going to need more information. Um, and one of them turned around and said, they're the ones that Kieran built. <laughs> so despite the fact that we had source control, we had repeatable build, we had ways to deploy stuff automatically into production, somebody had built things on their own machine and got them into a production environment. Horrendous. Anyway, when I actually want to talk about environment control is two things. The first is to control the environments that you have. And the second is to control the environments that you have. And I know what you're thinking, I was lost it again. But there's two sets of things here. The first is, OK, what environments do you need? Yep. Now, all of you that work in larger environments will have seen this, or larger organizations will have seen this. But what often happens is that you start off with a new project or a startup. 
and you go, we're really cool, we build locally, we have an integration environment, and we have production. So good, right through. And then you're like, oh, we need to do some user testing. So we're gonna get a UAT environment. And actually, there's a bit of dev integration we need to do before we actually do testing. So we're gonna separate integration into like a dev environment and a test environment. So you've got dev, test, UAT. But then you find there's a UA2, UAT2 and a UAT3 and a staging environment, and obviously you need a pre-production environment, and you need a post-production. You've seen this happen, right? These environments just, just proliferate and proliferate. And the reason that they proliferate is primarily uh, because of end-to-end -end testing. Um, our uh, tall Cornish friend has spoken about this in the past. Um, JB Rainsberg has updated his blog post recently to talk about this, and he said that he, um, he regrets the tone of his, um, of his uh, blog post, um, but he, he, believes in, he believes in the content still. Um, and the problem with, I, I don't say they're a scam, but I think end-to-end -end testing is a trap. Yeah? It seems obviously logical and common sense that if you've got a large system that runs end-to-end, -end, you should test that large system end-to-end -end before you put it into production, right? It, it's kind of logical, but it becomes a bit of a fallacy, particularly as you scale, because as you scale, the cost of maintaining that gets higher and higher, and it grows exponentially. Um, and actually, the time it takes to do it grows exponentially. And actually, the chance of it being useful uh, and actually finding problems sort of deteriorates. So end-to-end -end testing, don't do it. I don't really have time to go too much into all the alternatives in this particular talk, but there's lots of stuff on this. So the second part is around controlling the environments that you have. And so a way to avoid this proliferation of environments is to create environments which are specific and disposable. Um, and what that means is that you have a use case where you need an environment, like you're doing a set of user testing. You create an environment for that user testing, and when the user testing's done, the environment goes away. So you might temporarily have UAT1, UAT2, and UAT3, but they'll actually be feature A testing, feature B testing, feature C testing, whatever, release A, release B, release C. So you create these things specific and disposable. And then one of the things here is that obviously uh, you can have them for lots of other reasons. So it might be you want to do an integration with a partner. Uh, so rather than being like, oh, can we get a post prod for three weeks in July, you create an environment for that testing with, with, with a partner. Um, and that way it means that the things will stay clean as well. You won't end up with lots of interruption between, between each other. Um, the way that you achieve this is obviously by things like infrastructure as code. It makes it much, much easier if you have concepts like infrastructure as code. So what that means is simply that you are, um, you are declaratively declaring the environments that you want to have. Yep. So rather than having to go in and build these things manually, uh, you're saying, we need an environment here. So you're going to hit a button, and it's going to say, we want an environment that looks like this. Uh, and the, the, the infrastructure as code software will make sure that that happens for you. Um, and actually, you can move this on to something which I call environment as a product, as, as a product is very in vogue at the moment. Um, but basically, that means that uh, teams, whoever they are, test teams, development teams, can just say, I want an environment. Yep. Push button deploy. They get the environment, and then actually we've had them auto expire in the past, or you know, if it's not being used, it just automatically gets torn down, so you don't see proliferation of costs. You actually find that if you look at most environments, the amount of usage that they get uh, is really low over, over a 24-hour period or over seven days, et cetera. So actually having things that can just be, um, be commissioned and torn down makes so much sense. Um, and obviously this, I've got a question for the audience, which is why did I choose these pictures? Anybody? Cat or not pets. <laughs> um, so the term cat or not pets uh, comes really originally from servers. So most people will probably remember having a production environment where you had named servers. Uh, and you'd come in in the morning and somebody would say, Zeus has had a problem. And everyone would go, oh, not Zeus. Not Zeus again. Zeus was so good. Uh, and you'd go and you'd check Zeus was OK, and you'd make them feel great. And basically, you'd treat that server as a pet. Yep. And the concept is you shouldn't do that. Servers should be cattle. They should uh, be part of a herd. You know, they should become, they should come, and they should get retired to the country or whatever happens to cattle um, when, when they're no longer needed, right? And that's what you should do. The point is, is that environments, it's exactly the same. Yep. If you treat your environments as cattle rather than pets, uh, it's, you will get the same benefits as treating servers as cattle, not pets, uh, in the fact that you, they will be specific and disposable, and you won't end up with this proliferation of environments that you can't control. Uh, and you won't have these, th these uh, environments where you're, you're going up and caring for them and feeding them and doing whatever else you would do for those things. Okay, we're going to talk about rollback. How many people have heard of Dora? The most common place that people have probably heard it is Dora Metrics. Um, Dora, DevOps Research and Assessment, it was originally created by um, Dr. Forsgren, Jess Humble, Gene Kim, 
uh, who are the authors of this amazing book, Accelerate, that everybody should read. Um, it's now owned by Google, so I don't know. Uh, Dora, by the way, not Accelerate. Um, I'm just going to quickly talk about what the Dora metrics are, because these are particularly useful in the context of this. So lead time for changes is a measure of how long it takes between checking in some code and that code being in production, being used by users. Deployment frequency is how often that process is happening, how often new things are going out to be used by, by users. Time to restore service is if there is a problem in production, how long does it take to get it better? That's often called MTTR, mean time to recovery. And finally, the change fail percentage. So of those frequently deployed deployments, how often are you seeing a failure? And one of the great things about the Dora metrics is that they do a, a state of DevOps report and they've looked at what uh, what is average for different teams who perform in different ways. Um, so I'm not going to go into this in detail, but you can see for each of those metrics, what have you got? If you work in a large organization, it's really worth getting teams to report on these things. Not because it will tell you that there is a problem, but it might tell you where you should go and look uh, for stories and see what's happening and why there is difference if there's difference between teams. What I want to quickly talk about with these four is the relationship between them. So these two at the top are basically your users getting new stuff. Um, and these two at the bottom is that stuff being available for them. So it's basically resiliency. One of the problems that a lot of organizations have is that when they start getting any issues with stuff being available, they focus down on how do we reduce the change fail percentage? How do we stop errors going into production? How do we stop that occurring? And so normally they'll increase validation, they might have release gates, they might introduce a second cab or have someone else who has to sign it off in blood. Um, but whatever they do there, the point is, is that it negatively affects getting new stuff. Yeah, you will absolutely see the lead time to change is growing and the deployment frequency shrinking. It's the natural thing that will happen. However, organizations that focus on the time to restore actually see higher confidence because when there is an issue, it's a non-issue. Yeah, the impact of it is so much smaller that people have a lot more confidence in allowing you to deploy more frequently. And so rollback is about restoring service in a timely manner. Obviously, that will give us happy users. So a few tips on doing rollback. First of all, rollback is much, much easier if you're limiting the scope that you're rolling back. If you have a massive monolith, end-to-end -end system, all deployed at the same time, many database, synchronized releases, et cetera, then rolling that back is a pain in the ass. That's going to take you time. It's not easy to do. If you've got a small microservice yeah, or you know, a, a small sort of a standalone application, which is stateless and has no dependencies, much easier to roll back. So this is one of the main reasons that we recommend limiting the scope of your applications and having a more modular architecture is because of the ability to roll back. Second thing is when you're building a rollback plan, focus on state and focus on contracts. So obviously database state, for example, particularly in a schema to database, you really want to be managing with deltas. Um, with contracts and with uh, database schemas, you can use an expand and contract method, which is that you add new fields that are non-breaking first, uh, and then you later remove them uh, as, you, as you go on. So you can read about expand and contract. It's usable in lots of different ways, but it's a way of essentially allowing yourself to roll back uh, you know, by not making any breaking changes. So we recommend that. Um, the final thing here is about rolling forward, and it's saying to not chase losses. Most of the teams that I talk to now don't know when they last actually did a rollback in production. Because the, the scope of the changes is so small and it's so well contained, the changes, the, the, the problems that normally happen are like obvious when they happen because the testing and monitoring tells them where to fail, they can roll forward and that's great. But like with gambling, if you roll forward more than once, you're probably in real trouble. And the only way you can really have confidence to use roll forward is that you're confident about your rollback. Yep. And the big thing with rollback is it's like backups. Yep. How do you have confidence that you've got a backup? Anyone? You restore it. How are you confident that you can roll back? You do it. You practice it. So I don't know how many people here work in teams that actually look after systems. I'm not going to ask for Sean hands on this, but think, when was the last time that you did a rollback of that system successfully, confidently, knowing that you're doing it? It's a lot lower percentage than you would think. So I don't want anyone to feel bad about that. But practice it. You can go and do a release which has no customer changes specifically to test, test a rollback. Obviously, you can try it in non-production environments first. Whatever you need to do to get the confidence. But once you've got it, you need to practice, practice, practice. Separating deploy and release in the time check. Um, so separating deploy and release, actually, let's just talk about the two terms first, just to be absolutely clear. So deploy is about taking software changes, putting them onto production infrastructure. Yep. Release is making the 
features that software changes have created available to users or available to customers, available to users. So that's what I mean by separating deploy and release. So traditionally, a, a software release, a big bang software release, obviously puts the change out. Maybe you've got blue green deployment or something, but puts the change out and at the point that you finished it, it's on all infrastructure and it's exposed to all users. Yep. So this is just another aspect of managing, uh, managing risk. Yep. So managing the likelihood and managing the impact of, uh, of, of failures in, in, in production. So it's another great way to help with those door metrics and get the confidence of your stakeholders. So in its simplest form, we can talk about user cohort selection, a feature flag. Yep. Uh, you know, who has stuff? So let's assume that you can release all of your software, a feature with all of your software to all infrastructure, but you have a feature flag. And that feature flag, this bit's impressive. If that feature flag is down, uh, no users get the feature. Uh, if that feature flag is up, all users, good, isn't it? Like that. Uh, all users get the, uh, get the feature. Um, so what you've then done is you've, you, you've separated problems potentially that are related to the deploy from problems that are potentially um, related to the release. The other thing is if that can go up and down, then it gives you a rollback mechanism for that. Because if you, went, if you did the deploy and it was OK, but you do the release and it's not OK, your rollback is to switch the feature flag back off, right? So it gives you a load of benefit um, by separating those two things. Um, the other thing to talk about here is the inf infrastructure selection. Um, so being able to select the users is great, um, but you also want to be able to select how you roll out uh, to infrastructure. So again, the, what I described before with a feature flag is that you roll out all to all your infrastructure, and then you select your users. But that rolling out to infrastructure in itself is dangerous. And I've got a tail of this, which is Cloudflare. And to be clear, I'm not giving Cloudflare a hard time here. They manage this brilliantly. They do public postmortems. It's fantastic. Um, Cloudflare, uh, CDN, uh, sort of computing platform. 2019, it was probably running about half of the internet. You know, it was ridiculous. Um, and they had an issue in 2019. Um, and I'll actually explain what happened. They, they released a feature, and they released it in what they call simulation mode which is dry run. So it was being evaluated, but it wasn't affecting any users. So it was kind of a, a half feature flag, if you like. Uh, this feature was basically selecting requests. So it was matching requests, and uh, it was using a regular expression to do that. Some of you already know where this is going. Um, as soon as they switched this on and all the infrastructure, as they were checking requests coming in, the regular expression consumed all of the CPU on all of the machines that they had globally. They lost about 80% of, of their estate, which obviously is a large proportion of the internet at the time. And they lost it for about half an hour. So pretty good, pretty good time, to, uh, time to restore. But obviously, it was a massive, massive impact. Uh, and that's because even though it wasn't being exposed to users, it was hitting all of their infrastructure at the same time. So obviously, in the same ways you can roll out uh, potentially incrementally to users, you can roll out incrementally to infrastructure as well. And separating the two is really important. Um, the other thing, actually, just to mention here, some people will do canary testing where they use the rollout to infrastructure as a way to rolling out to cohorts. I don't recommend it. I think the two are separate concerns. You should be rolling out to infrastructure once and rolling out to, to users once. You can do that in an interleaved way. So you can roll out some infrastructure and then test with some users. There's lots of different ways to configure it, but mixing the two is a mistake. The only thing I want to mention here actually is shadowing and, and teeing, which is just another technique which is related, uh, which can be quite useful. And that basically is that you take some production traffic or some production events or some production data and you tee it so that you can pipe it to another environment, uh, a non-production environment, uh, maybe a, a, a specific and disposable environment, for example. Um, and actually, you run the same logic there. So again, this is a way of running and testing some functionality without risking impact on your users. It's just another feedback loop. So in a way, it's really just another type of shift left. And then we're going to get to production intimacy. Again, genuine drink, not even going to look at the notes. I did look at the notes a little bit. Um, I think we've been together long enough now to talk a little bit about a, a sort of a more intimate topic. I hope you don't mind. Um, not really. I was feeling really awkward now. Um, oh, sorry. Didn't even give you a trigger warning there. Um, it's hard to talk about kind of the relationship between uh, development teams and production in 2023 without talking uh, about observability. Um, but this is an example of one of those terms that I talked about at the beginning, uh, where it's been horribly hijacked. So I will talk about the three uh, pillars uh, in a moment. Um, Charity Majors, who's the CTO of a company called Honeycomb, who really were 
really coined the term observability in relation to software particularly. Um, talked about this a lot. She's a very generous writer and speaker, lots of information. I recommend you read everything that she's got to say on the topic. Um, but one of the things that she talks about, she had a very amusing tweet, which is that lots of the literature out there at the moment talks about the three pillars of observability. Uh, and it talks about logs, metrics, and traces. It says these are the three pillars of observability. And Charity's uh, sort of Twitter uh, tweet uh, is th these are not the three pillars of observability. And when you actually look where you find all this literature that says that these are the three pillars of observability, it's by software vendors that generally sell software that has logs, metrics, and traces. Um, and now they call it an observability suite. But the point is, it, it's not. Um, in the context of this talk, Logs, metrics, and traces are great, right? If you've got access to them as a development team, yeah? If in order to get access to a production log, you've got to sign a document in blood in Triplicate, then it's not gonna help you to help your users, yep? And it's not gonna keep you connected to the way that things are running in production. Really what observability is about is about having empathy with users in order to focus on customer satisfaction. And I frame kind of customer satisfaction in, in, in sort of two separate ways here. Uh, the first is reliability, and we talked about reliability a bit already. You know, we talked about Endora metrics, uh, and this is making sure that the, the stuff that you build is, is available to users uh, you know, and is, is high quality. But the other part of customer satisfaction is what's been talked about by Jeff and Laura in various talks on the product track today, which is about desirability, feasibility, viability. And I think when you talk about things like continuous delivery or you talk about uh, you know, development teams and things. It really feels like everybody wants to talk about the quality uh, in terms of you know the, the technical quality, does it work or not? But whether it works and whether it works for the user are so connected uh, in the way that they work. And the best continuous delivery products teams that I see care about both of these things equally. Jeff called these outcomes in, the, in his keynote. So focusing on customer satisfaction. Um, and the way that I found is the best to, to allow um, dev teams to really focus on customer satisfaction is, is you build it, you run it. So how many people have heard of you build it, you run it? How many people are doing you build it, you run it out of interest? Okay, less. So you build it, you run it is basically the fact that product teams should also operate their software in production. The people who build it should also be running it. That means that they'll be on call um, and it means that they'll be the first people to deal with incidents that are happening with their products in production. I mean, obviously, when I just described that, you can see that there's going to be a massive improvement on the quality of things that go into production when you're the one who's being got out of bed when something goes wrong, right? It just creates a really strong feedback loop. Um, there is a bunch of material. Is this slow or is it not pressed it? So my colleague, Bethan Timmons, writes about this a lot. Uh, her and Steve Smith, who I'm contract contractually obliged to mention at least twice in every one of my conference talks, um, but they have created a playbook, which you can download for free, uh, on You Build It, You Run It. Um, for me, I think you can't really consider it to be continuous delivery if that continu continuity ends when something gets thrown over the wall into production. So I think you know, everything that we talked about in terms of shifting left and everything is so important. Like what you know, is, let me say this, I, don't, I can't think of a further example of shifting things left than shifting, like the looking after the production users, the real users left. That's ultimately what we mean when we talk about these terms here. So I'm gonna try and wrap up and we're gonna have time for questions, which is good. So I'm gonna just quickly go through these again. So first of all, portable checks. Shifting quality left, isolating yourself from others in terms of integration failures, um, creating your flow state, so important baked brick or golden artifact, whatever, the same thing that you create should be deployed on all environments, and that golden artifact should be created by a repeatable build. So obviously source control, manage dependencies. Environment control, don't do end-to-end -end testing, full stop. If you want to talk about that more later, I will talk to you, or you can go and find Steve. Um, but yeah, don't do end-to-end -end testing. Uh, try and make your environments uh, specific and disposable. That's, that's the target that you're having for environments. Roll back. Uh, practice it, practice it, practice it. Limit the scope of the things that you're having to roll back. Uh, roll forward, but never chase your losses. Uh, separating deploy and release. Things going on to production ideally should be rolled out incrementally. Things going to users should also be rolled out incrementally, but separate the two. And finally, be intimate with your production environment, care about your users, and extend your continuous delivery all the way into the production environment. And that's kind of the six small steps, but the rest really is up to you. Thank you very much.
Wow. Look at that. Ten minutes left. Ten minutes of questions. Perfect. This is great. Um, who has a question? <laughs> Hi, yeah, thanks very much for the talk. How possible is it to uh, integrate all of this? I'm thinking particularly um, uh, feature uh, tagging, switching yep. uh, in a platform that didn't start with it. So if you've already got a monolithic lump of non-feature tagged stuff, how realistically can you reverse engineer that kind of thing? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think actually, so, so feature toggling as an example, I think is probably quite an easy one to implement. There's lots of different ways that you can do it. I mean, if, you, if you're a developer, you could imagine that you have, I'm not suggesting you should do this, but theoretically you have an if statement in code and you say, if the thing I receive from this service says it's configured on, do it. If not, don't, right? One of the things I do want to say on feature toggling particularly, and this was a question I had at a previous talk is, um, you, I'm talking here about the benefits of feature toggling, right? Saying feature toggle everything, but there is a cost. So what you've got to be really careful about is if you are releasing regularly, if you're deploying regularly and you've got feature toggles, it can get completely out of control, right? You, you, you're still creating the risk of um, like the um, over configurable kind of anti-pattern of having this complexity of all of the different possible options of flags that are on or off. So I don't believe you should have feature flags long-term. I don't believe you should have too many feature flags. But I think something like that's quite easily um, buildable in. I think a, a lot of these things can, uh, and I, I am quite conscious when I finish this talk that obviously some of this is like, there's the out, right? Yeah, just draw it. Um, and I'm trying to sort of give some different focuses that you can have on it. And I think all of those focuses can be done incrementally on existing code bases in smaller ways. So I think what I really want to do here was give some hooks that you can go and look at. So if, for example, feature flagging was the one to choose, then try and look at like how to do feature flagging without a fully functioning feature flagging framework, whatever, right? You know, just how do you do that just manually? Um, but yeah, I, th I think things. I think most of the things here can be done uh, incrementally, iteratively on a legacy on a legacy environment. But it won't necessarily be quick. Right? Cool. Next question. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Um, so I've uh, so I've got sort of most of my projects have all got sort of production, integrate, and test environment, right? And uh, I like what you said, obviously, about the um, reusable environments in terms of you could have feature one environment, feature two environment, feature three environment, which is all great stuff. But the biggest problem with that is it costs, right? How do you solve that? How do you keep those costs down? Um, how do you manage that? So I think I sort of touched on this briefly, but I'll sort of expand on it a little bit more. So I think when you look at the cost of environments, it, it depends on whether you're in cloud, whether it's on, on prem, et cetera, but most environments have really low utilization, right? You know, depending on your development cycle, well, first of all, you're probably only working five days a week and, and in business hours, right? Um, so those environments are often sitting idle in those cases. Uh, often the, the, the size of environments is much bigger than you need for the, the amount of uh, traffic and stuff that you, you have testing, right? Um, so depending on your cost base, often the cost of maintaining these things idle is much more than having a higher quantity of environments at a much smaller, smaller rate. So the fact that they're disposable is what's really important there. And actually, if you get your sort of infrastructure as code and your automation of those environments good enough, then you can literally run them up. And this is actually the pattern that you have in a lot of cases now is that there is no integration environment. There is no te te uh, like test environment, et cetera. There is a continuous integration environment, which is that the continuous integration will run, it will spin up an environment, it will run all of the tests in an automated fashion, and once that's done, it will be released. There are no long-lived environments in that situation at all. And you're, you, know, you may have many environments that day, you may have a, a hundred develop, uh, environments spun up that day, but each of them runs for three and a half minutes or whatever. So I, th I think you can manage the cost in that way, but don't, whatever you do, end up with many specific but not disposable environments, because that's even worse. So we're trying to be, um, we try, we're trying to encourage and implement CI CD as much as possible um, in our company. However, I feel like there's some sort of bottleneck which is slowing us down. It doesn't really feel continuous. And the reason for that is because um, our product creates artifacts that goes out to external customers and systems. But once it's out there, it's kind of hard to reverse it and take it back and fix it if there's something wrong. Uh, so our product team is very cautious of this. and. Uh, they do a lot of manual testing as well 
Um, but there, it seems like there's a fear factor of going live. Um, so it seems like we've implemented CICD, but product is not allowing us to really be continuous and flow freely as much as we want. How can we resolve that? So I think it's an, it's an interesting case that you've got. So I think what you're saying is that there is some sort of um, artifact that once it's gone out, you no longer have control over. So, so essentially, I, I guess it's, it's, a, it's a higher risk operating environment. So you could argue the same if you're doing something which is making a major financial transaction, right? Once you've made that transaction, if it went really badly wrong, you could be in real, real trouble. Or let's be even more serious, right? You're building something for med tech. Uh, and it's something that's going to run in a hospital and people are going to die, right? So I think that the level of, you know, when you're talking about the risk management, the level of um, how easy it is to roll back, you can't roll back, right? You can't roll back if you kill somebody, right? So so, so that changes your risk appetite massively. Um, and I don't think there's anything here that says you have to be going to production regularly. That's one of the things, right? If there are reasons why you can't, then you can batch those particular changes potentially. So obviously without knowing the full context, it's hard, but you can potentially have a different cadence for those things which the organization feels are higher risk uh, than, than others, right? So you could be making a bunch of changes, creating a second report or artifact in, internally, which people are comfortable with for a period of time, and then just roll over the artifact. But you know what I mean? So something like that. So I think it's about risk appetite, but I think everything downstream can still can still be continuous. You can still be at the point when at any point, if the customer need had to be satisfied, you can you can do the do the release at that point. Would I be right in saying that this is the difference between delivery and deployment? Like your queue can be continuously delivering things internally, but it doesn't actually get deployed until people need it. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, next question. Um, yeah, great talk, by the way. Thank and um, I was quite interested in your piece about end-to-end -end testing. I found it very quite a challenge to wean stakeholders off the comforts of end-to-end -end testing and big end-to-end -end testing environments. Have you got some top tips on how you might do that? Yeah, I, it's funny. This will be a really, really nice, abstract, fluffy answer, I think. But um, yeah. It's trust, isn't it? That's what it, you know, we talk about trust, we talk about confidence. So there's two ways to do that. One is to point out that the thing that they're attached to isn't actually providing them that much safety. So if, if they are create, if they're having confidence from something which isn't providing them much safety, you can kind of take a negative effect and degrade that. You've got to be a bit careful with that because it might, might leave you in a bit of a wasteland. But then the other is to, to find other ways incrementally to, to treat them with confidence. So you start making sure that you're um, surfacing metrics and measurements that are truly reflective of whether something's a problem. Uh, I, I, there's been a few conversations on this sort of thing, but it's well, if, if, people, if people don't have a good view of what's inside the box, that's where micromanagement happens, right? You know, if you think about if people don't know what, 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 what a team is doing, I think this was one of the talks, if you don't know what a team is doing, you micromanage because you're, you're scared and you're scared of things that you can't see and don't know. Um, so the answer in that case is to just constantly broadcast information about what the team is doing so that stakeholders have confidence. I think it's the same in, in, in this case, is that you, you start creating metrics that are showing like uptime or you know, showing uh, how small the mean time to recovery is or how infrequently you have incidents um, and, and, and gain the confidence in, in that way um, and, and then potentially start winning them off at the end to end. Absolutely loads, absolutely loads. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it worked in lots of places. And, and it's not in isolation, I think. It's not, you know, if you've got a, a monolith in a, a, a cyclic kind of deployment, um, then you're not just going to go, let's change all the end-to-end -end testing. You're going to be doing all of these other things. That's the thing. These are definitely not six small steps that you do independently. All of those things should be should be raising at different times. So, um, but for in, in that particular case, somebody's got a big monolith and they're doing lots of end-to-end -end testing, we'd create one component with strong contract tests either way, so that we could start deploying that component really quickly and be really confident that was working well and be really confident that it wasn't going to have a negative impact on, on any other things, for example. Cool. Time for one last question. One hand. Cheers, Phil, thanks. Um, so you didn't put them in any particular order, 
I guess. Is there is there one area that you would start in if somebody was starting from fresh and there's a little there's a few areas that you think you should focus on. First, sorry, one area you think you should focus on first. Which one do you think is going to give you kind of the best feedback loop or the best return on investment? So the, they, they, I, they weren't necessarily intentionally, but I think they kind of were a bit. They, 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 I was thinking about it, I, I don't know whether I didn't think about this, but I think I did it subconsciously. It's kind of that these were the order they were in, and it's almost like left to right in a traditional cycle. Like this is a local development environment thing. Uh, this is about what you're building to, to release. This is about the environments that you're going through. This is about getting back from production. This is about going further, and then this is its long term living. Just kind of gone in that way. I, I, I found often just politically, or sort of socio-technically, it's, it's easier to just do some of this stuff first, right? So I've gone into organizations where there's been a legacy code base and they've had no good portable things and we've been like, right, how do we create cycle in isolation locally that gives us confidence? Um, and so, 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 so that's probably the place to start, mainly just because it's easier to, there's less people involved, particularly if you're, you know, you're, you're new to an organization. So it's certainly in a consultancy way. Thank you. Thank you.